Welcome to the Planet Laundry Podcast. This message is brought to you by Planet Laundry, the magazine of the Coin Laundry Association. In this episode, editor Bob Neiman interviews Dave Mentz. He's the president and owner of Queen City Laundry, a chain of full-service, fully-attended stores in Cincinnati, Ohio. This message is brought to you by Continental Gerbao. When it comes to new laundry development or existing laundry renovation, Continental Gerbao has your back. We work closely with our distributor network and provide ongoing services before, during, and after the sale. We help evaluate potential laundry locations, conceptualize your laundry's equipment mix and amenities, develop a pro forma cash flow summary, and once your financing is approved, assist with laundry development, signage, marketing, and technical services. At Continental, we have your back now and into the future. Today I'm with Dave Menz, uh, a 12 year veteran of the laundromat industry. Uh, Dave is currently the owner of Queen City Laundry, uh, a chain of full service, fully attended laundromats in the Cincinnati market. Uh, Dave, I know you're a super busy guy and I really appreciate your time today. Thanks for being with us. Sure. Yeah, I appreciate you having me, Bob. Absolutely. Well, let me. Uh, I know you've been in the in the industry for quite a while. Uh, can you let's take it back to maybe 2009, I believe, when you entered the business. Um, how did you get involved uh, in the laundromat industry? How did that uh, all come about? Well, I, you know, I like to tell people it was kind of dumb luck. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, I, I was a passionate entrepreneur from a very young age. Um, but I was never really prepared to own a business. You know, as I became an adult, I had a desire to own a business, but I wasn't really prepared. I didn't even know what that looked like, to be honest. Uh-huh. And in my late twenties, I started to kind of take it, you know, my dream real seriously. And so I realized, um, you know, no one's going to come along and, and give me these opportunities. I have to be prepared and take them. And so me and my wife took pretty seriously the fact that we needed to start preparing for an opportunity that was coming in the future that we didn't even know what it would look like. Mm-hmm. And so we, we spent several years living well below our means with our you know full-time corporate jobs and saving for that opportunity. And uh, long story short, we eventually you know took that nest egg that we saved over time, and uh, we bought a local laundromat near my house that was, believe it or not, it was losing money. Uh-huh. Um, really? And we we turned it we turned it around, made mm-hmm. it profitable, mm-hmm. and uh, you know turned it turned it into a community asset. Mm-hmm. And so uh, that's that's kind of the quick version of how we got into the industry. It was you know a lot of people that get in the industry they I've I've learned that they're they're fascinated and and looking into laundromats. And I kind of tell people you know my my story's a little bit different. I was just looking for any business that fit a certain mold, mm-hmm. and it just so happened that this industry did, and there was an opportunity close to my house. And so I kind of I kind of backed into the industry. <laughs> now I look at it, but, uh, but yeah, it's been a tremendous blessing, and I can't imagine doing anything else. Yeah, yeah. Well, you said you were kind of looking for a certain mold or a certain type of model as a new investor back then. What first attracted you to? the laundromat business and that whole model? What, what were the uh, what were the advantages uh, as you saw them? Well, you know, I, when I when I kind of stumbled upon this local laundromat for sale, I, you know, I did my homework, I dug hard, uh, you know, researched my competitors. I mean, I had a kind of a pragmatic approach to the business and it was losing money and wanted to make sure that I wasn't buying something that was going to keep losing money. And the more I dug into the industry and dug into that specific business and my market, the more I realized that this this business and this opportunity was perfect for me because I didn't I didn't have a lot of money to invest in this, and I needed my full time job, so I couldn't quit my job, mm-hmm. um, regardless of what business I bought. Mm-hmm. And I, to be honest with you, as silly as that sounds, like I, I didn't realize that at first. <laughs> like, yeah. Yeah. It, it took me a few years to like register, like okay, I can't run most businesses and keep a full time job. Mm-hmm. And I still didn't actively seek out the water about industry, which is really kind of interesting to me now. Right. Um, but so I, you know, I, I guess you could say that I kind of backed into the industry in the sense that that I I I, I realized that it was a unique opportunity that. Mm-hmm. Now, everybody likes to refer to outside the industry. They like to refer to our industry as being passive. And we all know that it's not fully passive, but it is semi-passive. Mm-hmm. And I think ultimately that was the thing that was attracted me to it is because I needed something that, that I could. 
could do around my job, at least temporarily. And that, that, that hit that mark for me. Perfect. Very good. Very good. Well, I know, I know uh, or at least I've read that you, you've referred to yourself as a laundromat rags to riches story. Can you tell me about that and what you actually mean by yeah. by that? Yeah. Um, well, I, you know, one of the things I've become really passionate about after I found some levels of success in our industry is I'm, I'm passionate about the industry, but I'm also passionate about reaching out and inspiring others mm -hmm. uh, because so many inspired me. And um, so that's a, that's a part of me kind of why I'm telling that story. But the, the really quick version is that I, I grew up really poor um, from birth and poverty mm -hmm. um, and lived most of my childhood in my hometown of Flint, Michigan, which is okay. now known for the water crisis. But it's definitely not a uh, not a thriving town. It hasn't been for 40 years. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I was, to be honest with you, I was never really very good at school. I, mean, I had a terrible memory. <laughs> Mm -hmm. uh, just yeah. naturally, some people have good memories. I didn't. Yeah. Um, this was a huge, huge disadvantage to me in life, um, as far as school and things like that. But I learned really young that I was and am very stubborn mm -hmm. and I'm very driven. Mm -hmm. So I never really bought into the kind of the victim mentality that is, you know, often taught in the world of poverty. Mm -hmm. um, and so I just simply believe that if others could do it, then why well, could not? That mm -hmm. I could find success in my own way. Unfortunately, because I wasn't good at school, um, I hated it, and I was pretty disinterested, and I didn't mm -hmm. cause problems. I just wasn't interested. Right. And so this led to a lot of adults and teachers, you know, telling me that, you know, I'd never amount to anything without mm. good grades and a college degree. Mm. And that, that kind of drove me further because my ambitions, my grit, my stubbornness, I knew I would be successful. I had no idea how, but I knew that I would be because I wouldn't settle for anything less. And I believe if anyone in the world was successful without a college degree and good grades, then if they could do it, why couldn't I? Right. And I wasn't afraid of hard work. And so I knew that over time, when I, when I became a teenager, I realized that entrepreneurship was my, was my path to a better life. Right. And so I became, you know, really passionate about that. And to be honest with you, I spent the better part of the first 10 or 15 years of my adulthood kind of searching and learning and kind of educating myself. And I've read nearly, <laughs> I've read nearly everything that I could find in my life on success, business, finance, entrepreneurship, and I eventually found my path, obviously, in the laundromat industry. Mm -hmm. And when I bought my first rundown, unprofitable laundromat, <laughs> you know, the little bit of seed money that I put into it and bought put a lot of uh, sweat equity and uh, made it profitable. Right. And. I basically what I did is I kept my full time job and I reinvested the money from my first store when it was profitable into a second. Mm -hmm. And then I took the money from those two and invested it into a third. And when I bought my third store I you know, I quit my job at that point and I began my journey as a full time business owner. Mm -hmm. And that's when things really started to skyrocket and opportunity really found me quickly and I was at that point I made sure I was always prepared for it. So I eventually bought a fourth store mm -hmm. and eventually started pick up and delivery services out of my store. And uh, the combination of all those things and grinding really hard, I woke up at the age of roughly 40 years old and just had this light bulb moment where I was like, oh my goodness, I'm a millionaire. <laughs> and, you know, I'm yes. I always tell you, I mean, a millionaire isn't what it was 30 years ago. Mm -hmm. So it, it's, you know, but, but it is a tremendous accomplishment and I'm proud of it especially in the short period of time that I've accomplished it. Mm -hmm. And so a big part of my passion for the industry and teaching others and being an advocate is that this has literally changed my life, but it's changed my family tree. I mean, literally. Mm -hmm. And so I'm very grateful for, for the laundromat industry and the people that are in the industry that, that are also advocates for the industry. Like, you, you know, you guys at the Planet Laundry and the Coin Laundry Association and all of the tremendous, you know, friendships that I've built over the year through all the networking I've done. I'm just really grateful for that. Right. So that's kind of the that's kind of the quick version of my yeah. my story. Yeah, well, it's it's certainly uh, it's an inspiring one, uh, and it's, I think it's one that uh, resonates with a, with a lot of folks out there. Uh, you've been kind of building your foundation of success well before you bought that first store, uh, and again through through your drive, through your grit. Uh, you have steadily grown that business, as you mentioned, uh, both in the number of stores uh, as well as in the types of services that you've offered. You're now full service, fully 
fully attended, which you weren't in the beginning. Um, what's what, what, what's the secret, Dave, to uh, successfully scaling a laundromat business? Because I know there's a lot of people out there. They've got the one store. They want to grow it. What's the secret? Yeah. Well, you know, I think there's a I think there's a few keys to success in, in most things in life. Um, at least at least when you're coming at it from the place that I did. Mm -hmm. um, but I don't I don't think they're really secrets. Um, to be honest, I mean I think it's common knowledge. Mm -hmm. One of the things I've learned is that as I tell my story and I try to inspire people, I've learned that a lot of people want what I have, but they're not willing to do what I've done to get it. And so, you know, I, I think grit is is a, is a cliche term and a, and a catchy word, mm -hmm. but it's it's really who I am to my core. And as I mentioned before, I'm I'm incredibly stubborn, but that can be a bad thing too. <laughs> <laughs> um, I learned in my childhood that being stubborn isn't always good. <laughs> um, so I've learned to channel my stubbornness in a way that is positive. Um, and although I don't, you know, claim to be in the air as uh, as successful as him, I like to think of myself as kind of the Tom Brady, you know, the NFL quarterback. Yeah, he's uh, he's known for being, you know, very self aware. Mm -hmm. That he isn't the smartest, the strongest, the most talented in the NFL. Mm -hmm. um, in fact, he believes, and he's probably right, that he's in the bottom category for all of those things compared to the rest of the NFL. Mm -hmm. And so when he got drafted in the sixth round of the NFL draft, he knew that he had to do things very differently if he was going to compete with people mm -hmm. um, in the NFL. And so I, I kind of learned that myself. I mm -hmm. mean, I, I think the key to success in our industry is really pretty simple, and it's passion, and it's or I even call it obsession at times. Mm -hmm. um, unfortunately, way too many people aren't passionate about their community, and they're not passionate about their business even mm -hmm. <clears throat> a lot of times. Mm -hmm. And I see many different business models in our industry, and any or all of them are done very, you know, very successfully by people, and they all seem to have these common traits of grit and stubbornness and uh, looking to serve others. And the reality is whether you're running, you know, one store or multi-store, you're running unattended or attended, mm -hmm. um, whether you have managers in place or you are your manager, yeah. um, even whether you run a drop-off service or don't or even pick up and delivery, I believe the keys are really all the same. And the keys are to focus on being the best mm -hmm. and to serve your customers with the best value proposition in your market. Because what I do in Cincinnati doesn't really matter if you're not in Cincinnati. What matters is your market, and I've, you know, I've had tremendous success running every type of laundromat or laundry service that I've mentioned above. Mm -hmm. I have a, mm -hmm. I have kind of a unique situation where I started unattended and, and literally it's unattended with no staff and a full time job, um, which is kind of the most plain Jane, simple business model in our industry. Mm -hmm. And I've transitioned over time through all of those different business models, and now have probably one of the more complicated. Uh, business models um, in our industry. But I think the key to the success is the same in every single one of them. Mm -hmm. And it's just being passionate, being, you know, caring about the community that you're serving, mm -hmm. and always focusing on providing the best value in the market. And a lot of people, you know, misunderstand what value is. But that's, that's been my key to success. And when I help, mm -hmm. you know, I do a little consulting in the industry and stuff. And when I help other entrepreneurs, you know, with their journey in the laundromat industry, that's the thing I tell them to focus on is serving their community mm -hmm. and providing the best value in your market. Right. There certainly are some, some overarching principles that apply across the board, uh, even though it's it's certainly yeah. not, a, not a cookie cutter industry. And uh, again, a lot of different types of laundromat operations out there those i think you really nail the uh again those those key principles to uh to profitability and, and, and success going forward yeah. um hey dave in your opinion uh, what are some of the hot button issues for laundry owners today well you know i i guess we all have different hot buttons in general <laughs> sure. Um, I mean, I'm pretty passionate. I'm pretty passionate about the fact that our industry is greatly underappreciated and, frankly, undervalued in society. Mm -hmm. um, and so that's that's become kind of a hot button issue for me. And I know some of my uh, some of some people that are like minded, like me in the industry, have become pretty passionate about that. And as I mentioned, I do a lot of consulting with laundromat owners all over the country. And it's apparent to me that way too many laundromat owners underestimate their own business and its potential. Mm. They, you know, after 11 years, I've come to the conclusion that this is
is one of the best businesses in America. Like, I believe that. Mm -hmm. And most owners are simply unaware of it or don't believe it, or they don't, they aren't approaching it that way. And so a big part of what I try to do with my consulting and stuff is just to show them the opportunity because a lot of times they buy or have bought the belief from society that we're quote unquote, just a laundromat. Mm -hmm. Um, mm -hmm. And so that's, that's something that's kind of a hot button issue for me. And I think it is for a lot of people that are operating at the top of the industry mm -hmm. and they see other people operating at different levels of the industry that, that quite frankly are good people. They have good intentions. They want to be great. They just don't understand the opportunity. And so a big part of why I've kind of become an advocate for the industry in the last few years is because I believe that it's really just a matter of education. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, I don't, I don't believe that there are people in our industry, I'm sure there's a few, but I don't believe that most people in our industry um, are interested in operating at the top of the industry. I think it's a matter of they don't understand the opportunity, or sometimes they understand the opportunity and they just don't understand how to do it, how to execute. Um, so I don't know if that makes sense, but there's, there's other hot button issues like uh, equipment replacement, mm -hmm. you know, for mm -hmm. example, uh, that's... Most laundromat owners believe that they, they can't afford to invest in their business, to reinvest in their business by replacing their equipment or having modernized payment systems. They they simply don't realize that these things will almost always pay for themselves right. in increased spend prices, increased gross sales, and yes, increased margins. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. I guess what I guess what I'm really saying is that I really believe most of the industry sell this industry short, including mm -hmm. themselves. Right. And I'm determined to do something about it, Bob. <laughs> I am. I mean, I guess it's my right. stubbornness. I know that I'm. I know that I'm one person. Mm -hmm. um, but I do believe that one person can make a difference, slowly but surely. Mm -hmm. And I'm very passionate about the fact that there's other people that are as passionate as me about these things. Mm -hmm. And so, a part of what I'm trying to do now in my my water that journey is to continue to operate my team at the top of the industry, but I'm also pretty passionate about um, networking and collaborating with the, the other like-minded people in our, in our industry who mm -hmm. see the opportunity that we have in front of us right. and want to take the industry to a different level. Mm -hmm. So I'm not under the illusion I'm doing it by myself, um, but I want to find those people. And so a part of me, you know, reaching out to do things like this podcast is I want to get the word out there that this is who Dave Menz is. This is what I believe. This is one of the things I'm really passionate about because I do know some people mm -hmm. um, in the industry and we've built great relationships and friendships based on being like-minded. But I know for a fact that there's probably thousands of more people out there that, that are nodding their heads right now as they're hearing me say these things. And I want to know them. I want to know them. I want to work with them. Um, I want to be a, a mutual, you know, collaborative effort for the industry. And it, I don't believe it has to be super organized. Like, we don't need to have a name or anything. Like, we could all just be kind of pushing in the same direction. Mm -hmm. And so I've become pretty passionate, you know, about our industry and taking it to another level. Um, so if anyone out there is listening to this that that is like-minded in that way, you know, I want to meet you. I want to know you. And, you know, right now at a lot of that involves technology and phone calls, which is fine. But hopefully we, you know, pretty soon get back to the point where we can meet face-to-face -face through the clean show and excellence in laundry and those face-to-face -face networking opportunities. And that, that can really strengthen our relationships too. But it's something that at 44 years old, I kind of feel like that's that's my purpose in life. And I'm, I'm still very passionate about running my local businesses. Mm -hmm. But I've built, I've built a pretty great team. And I built a lot of great systems in my organization, but so that my businesses don't rely on me. You know, I don't need to go into the stores every day and do anything specific. I have systems and people in place that do those things. And so that kind of frees up a lot of my time to, to kind of, you know, what I call elevate the industry. Mm -hmm. So it's something that for whatever reason, it's been put in my heart. It's something that I'm passionate about. And I believe there's a lot of opportunity and I, I do believe that one person can make a difference, but I, I believe that all of us working together that feel the same way can can make even more of a difference collaboratively. So I'm I'm a pretty big advocate for collaboration nowadays. Absolutely. Well, you know, as you've mentioned, you've uh, you've certainly been advocating for the industry. You've been uh, doing uh, some consulting in recent years. Um, you know, as you travel around and as you talk to other folks, uh, what are some of the biggest concerns you're hearing from from other store owners and maybe from new investors around the country? Um, what are they concerned about? What's on their mind? Um, you know, 
You know, I, I think probably the number one concern, and this kind of goes a little bit back to a few things I talked about a minute ago, mm-hmm. is slipping margins sure. and profitability. Because the profitability of our industry and the margins in our industry are slipping. And um, that's that's something that we should acknowledge as an industry and say, what can we do to change that? And I believe a lot of that goes back to, you know, as our industry becomes more and more sophisticated, us existing business owners, we have to adapt and that, you know, we, we have to always have a thirst for knowledge. We have to look for better ways to do things mm-hmm. because even if the way that we've done things in the past worked really well and we found tremendous success and, and that doesn't make them a bad way to continue to do things, but I'm pretty passionate about always pushing the envelope and there, there, I believe there's always a better way to do things and that no matter no matter how strong my team is or my processes that I can always improve. Mm-hmm. And, you know, I, I have the philosophy, I tell my clients this all the time, I have the philosophy of even if I were perfect, even if my organization was perfect, we had perfected the industry, we had learned everything there was to learn, there was nothing we didn't know about the industry. Mm-hmm. The reality is we go to bed and we wake up tomorrow and there are different opportunities because the industry is changing. The industry, right. like... If I compare 11 to 12 years ago when I got into a business to today, it is literally a different industry. It is completely different Mm -hmm. than it was 10 years ago. Mm -hmm. So I can't imagine people that are continuing to operate with the same operations that they were 30 or 40 years ago. I I don't have any basis for that, but I can't imagine that it's not also drastically different. Mm -hmm. And I know when I look at like the clean show, which I'm always at, and uh, you know when I look at the last few clean shows, it's been very eye-opening to me the the opportunities that are out there, specifically with technology, um, but the opportunities that are out there in our industry uh, to to take your business to another level, to quote unquote elevate your business. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think I think a lot of times as business owners, we get to a certain point where we find a certain level of success. We're comfortable and we're happy with that, and we're content, and we tend to we tend to just kind of you know ride it and believe that we figured it all out. We've arrived, um, and the reality is those all may be somewhat true. But the truth is, the industry is passing you by if you believe that, because the industry is always evolving, it's always changing, and there is so many good things happening in our industry. And I really believe that there's so many people out there that just aren't even aware. They have no idea, and they need to have their eyes open. Mm-hmm. Uh, but mm-hmm. if they're not willing to open their eyes, then there's nothing any of us can really do. Mm-hmm. But I'm focused on the people that do have their eyes open and are looking and, and want that information. Right, right. Perfect. Great, great points. Um, Ten plus years in the industry now, Dave, what's your favorite aspect of this business? Or has it changed over the years? What do you enjoy most? Um, it's definitely changed over the years. Um I mean, I don't think I ever didn't have these things. Let me clarify that. But my favorite aspect of this business is people. And that means, like, fellow fellow uh, laundromat owners, fellow entrepreneurs, people that are, you know, advocating for the industry like Planet Laundry and things like that. Um, and then it's the community that we serve. Um, so it's the, I guess you would say it's the industry collectively. Um, and then it's the communities that we serve collectively. Because I, I love that we are a vital community resource. Like, I can honestly say, it mm-hmm. sounds silly now, but I can say when I got in the business, I had no idea. Like, I was just trying to make some money. Mm-hmm. I really was. I mean, I was raised to serve people and to help people, and so that was a focus of mine. Mm-hmm. But I had no idea, you know, the, the whole pandemic. I mean, we are essential. That's not... That's not a cliche word. Mm-hmm. We are absolutely essential to our communities. Mm-hmm. And so if we're not operating at the top of our capabilities, the top of our industry in our communities, mm-hmm. then you know we're not serving our communities to the level that we should. Mm-hmm. And then the flip side of that is in the industry, us fellow laundromat owners and, and advocates, if, if we're not networking and collaborating and sharing information with each other to help make each other better and make the industry better, then we're not serving our industry the way that we could and the way that we should. Unfortunately, in the past, there's there's been some situations where some people, uh, you know, want to withhold information and, and and keep it a try to keep it a secret, for lack of a better term. And I get that. I mean, nobody wants to help their competitor two miles up the road operate better. So, I mean, I get that in a way. Mm-hmm. But as an industry, I just really believe we're all stronger if we if we work together. 
we network, we build relationships, we show genuine interest in each other's success. And that's going to help us serve our communities better, and that's how we're going to elevate the industry. Very good. Well, on the other hand, do you have a least favorite uh, aspect or something that you, you least enjoy about running uh, your laundromat chain? Um, you know, I think probably a couple things. One, for me, like because I am obsessive and I am very, very passionate, it's kind of exhausting, <laughs> if I'm honest. Like, mentally, right. like, it's exhausting to always, every day, be pushing the envelope. Yeah. So it, it, can, it can really challenge me mentally at times. And, and that's something that's self-imposed. I do it to myself <laughs> uh, because I'm, in, I'm a driven and ambitious person, and I always see opportunities to be better. So th there's that, but that's, that, like I said, that's kind of self-imposed. Um, but I think other than that, I think, I think my least favorite – part of the industry is that the word laundromat has such a negative connotation associated with it uh, in society. Uh, um, right. But as I mentioned, I don't want to beat a dead horse. I believe we can change that. Absolutely. Um, but yeah. that's something that I don't necessarily enjoy because I'm proud of our industry. Mm -hmm. um, and, and I don't necessarily have a big ego and I don't need people to stroke my ego or anything like that. But, you know, I, I do want society to, to learn and understand what great people are in our industry and what kind of servant attitudes that they have towards their communities, um, and that we're not just the laundromat. So I think that's that's my least favorite part of it, which I guess is I guess is why I'm passionate about doing something about it. <laughs> right, right. No, it makes makes total sense. Uh, Dave, you brought up a couple times your your staff and uh, and how uh, yeah. they're really. Um, Really, a, just a, just a group of rock stars that uh, help you uh, do what you do every day. So, uh, for so many owners, staffing and labor is is their biggest hurdle. Uh, and and you've got a staff yeah. of I think approximately forty employees, correct? Right. That's okay. Right. 40, can, yeah. can you share how you've created and retained uh, like a quality motivated staff of, of that size? Are there any uh, any yeah. tricks or strategies you can share with other owners who may be struggling? Yeah, there, there's several, and honestly, that could take up the whole podcast by itself, <laughs> so I'll, I'll try not to get too deep, because um, this is also something I'm pretty passionate about, but it's really a passion for people. Mm -hmm. What I mean by that is, you know, I came from corporate America. I worked for the local telephone company here in Cincinnati for 17 years before I quit and did my laundromat thing full-time, and unfortunately, not just this company specifically, but a lot of large corporate America environments um, people are just cogs in a machine. They're just numbers. And I don't think that the people at the top intend for it to be that way. I think they just get so big that it just ends up happening, unfortunately. But when I got into business for myself, I was really passionate about, you know, I, I didn't know anyone that liked coming to work. And I worked at a fairly large company. Mm -hmm. um, they liked the money. They liked the benefits, you know, but they, they didn't really like the environment, the culture. Um, and they certainly didn't feel um, valued. And so I was... I decided when I got into business for myself, whether I had one, five, or 20 employees, that I never wanted them to feel that way, and I wanted to do everything I could to avoid it. And so we've worked really, really hard over the years to, um, you know, every few months to improve our processes and to improve our what we call our core team, which is, you know, exactly what it sounds like. It's the, the core of our company. Um, that's, and those people and those processes are always focused on company culture and treating others the right way, mm -hmm. even if it's not the most profitable thing to do. We believe in the long term it will be the most profitable. Um, but So th I know that's, a, that's kind of a big picture answer, mm -hmm. but like I said, I, right. I don't want to dig too deep, but it's really about, you know, we put systems and processes in place that help us to attract and find good people. Mm -hmm. And a, a quick tip on that is we work with a local staffing agency that's a, actually a national franchise. <clears throat> But they have a location here in Cincinnati, and we've learned a lot from them because staffing is their expertise. And so I've kind of networked and buddied up with them to learn their business. And in turn, we also have contracted and hired them to do some hiring for us. And so we've learned a lot from them about the, about the process of, like, compensation, for example. Mm -hmm. And one of the things they taught me real quickly was, like, when us laundromat owners are looking for store attendants, um, that's kind of an entry-level position in most situations. Mm -hmm. And so a lot of people think, well, entry level position, I'm going to pay minimum wage. Whatever minimum wage is, that's what I'm going to pay. And the reality is that if you pay minimum wage, then you're competing with the bot, 
bottom labor pool. Mm-hmm. And if you pay slightly above, you're still compar- competing with the bottom of the labor pool. Mm-hmm. So one of the things that they taught me is that in almost any environment, minimum wage is what it is, it's relative, that if you compensate your entry-level employees at roughly $3 an hour above the minimum wage, then you're going to find and attract a, what they call a second-tier labor pool. Mm-hmm. And you're not going to be competing with those fast food restaurants and that that bottom tier labor pool. You're, you're obviously not going to be attracting people with an MBA or something, but mm-hmm. you're going to you're that next tier up. And mm-hmm. what they've explained to me is there's typically a huge difference in the quality of employee you get mm-hmm. as far as their attitude, their reliability, mm-hmm. their caring of other people, their their lack of selfishness. Mm-hmm. And so that was a really eye opening thing for me. And that's just one mm-hmm. little thing mm-hmm. that we've. We've done, and we've made. We know we don't see it as an expense. We see it as an investment mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. in our business, in our people. And so we put. That, like I said, that's just one quick example. But mm-hmm. we put processes in place that help us find and attract good people. Mm-hmm. Because you can't train them or keep them if you can't find them and attract them. Mm-hmm. And so that's kind of like key number one. And then the key to keeping them and and is giving them upward mobility, giving them opportunity for growth. Um, and that comes from a business that's growing. You know, we've, we went from one to two to three to four stores. We're in the process of acquiring another one right now. We didn't used to do drop off, but now we do, which creates a new revenue stream, which creates an opportunity for bonuses. Um, we've added trainers and then we added our pickup and delivery business, which has just exploded. Um, and the pickup and delivery business alone has probably 16 or 17 of our employees, um, on that side of the business. And so that gives people an opportunity for upward mobility or even sometimes lateral mobility where they, you know, maybe they like what they, they're okay with what they make, but they not real crazy about what they do. It gives people opportunities and gives them options. And so we kind of, overall, we tried to create this culture where one, our people know we care about them. One, we compensate them at what we consider to be the top of the industry um, so that we're attracting a different level of employee. And then once they reach there, our core team is always focused on our culture and how not only we treat our customers, but how we treat each other. Uh, because we don't want to be a culture where people don't feel valued. We want to be a business that values people, meaning values our customers, and they know it, but also values our, our team. Right. And so when you attract the right people and you compensate them fairly, um, and then you create a culture where they want to work, where they enjoy coming to work, they enjoy their coworkers. Um, it it, it kind of takes care of itself. No, I don't. I don't. I don't think I end up giving you a short answer. <laughs> so I apologize. <laughs> no, no, uh, but that's that's actually a really big deal. It's a really really big deal, and it is. Uh, there's a lot of people in the industry that reach out to me with that specific question. Right. They're like, I want to do that. How did How did you do it? Mm-hmm. And mm-hmm. there isn't a quick answer. I mean, it could literally be a two-hour conversation. Right. But that's the that's the quickest answer I can give you. <laughs> <laughs> I, I appreciate your brevity, um, but yeah, it's uh, it's certainly. I think you, you hit it on the head when you said that uh, you know the, the, your employees and your and your and your, your workforce are uh, your investment, and you need to treat it as an investment uh, in your business and in your success. And uh, I appreciate Absolutely. the uh, the responses on that. Hey, Dave, with everything yeah. else you have going on, uh, you have a book coming out later this year. Uh, it's going to be called La- yeah. Laundromat Millionaire. Congratulations. Right. Yeah, thank you. Appreciate that. <laughs> uh, how, how does it feel to be an yeah. author? Well, I, uh, you know, it, it's, it's also one of those things that I never saw myself doing. Mm-hmm. Um, but years ago, I just realized that, you know, kind of like my consulting, I just realized that I was put in this position have this story to tell Mm -hmm. and um it's on my heart to tell it and so i don't claim to be the most polished author um (laughs) but you know i'm 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 telling my story putting it on paper and then i'm hiring some people that can make it professional (laughs) so So hopefully it'll be a, a nice finished product that can really inspire um a lot of people obviously it's gonna hopefully impact our industry more than anything but i'm i'm trying to you know, write it in a context of that, that whole like rags of riches success story and the, the key components that that I see as kind of my um, my cracking the code, you know, my ace in the holes, if mm-hmm. you will, which is obviously not just one. And so a lot of what is, is going to be in the book is going to really um, 
it could potentially cover a lot of different industries. It's going to talk about my specific journey mm-hmm. in the laundromat industry, the specific things that I did to get to where I am. Um, and, and some of them are pretty, pretty drastic, quite frankly. It goes back to, you know, a, a lot of people want, want to accomplish great things, but then when they talk to people that have accomplished great things, they realize, oh, I don't, I don't, I don't know if I want to, if I'm willing to do that. Right. Um, right. But so it, it's really, it's really just about, once again, it's about, um, elevating our industry, and I really hope that it will bring. You know, I'm not under any illusion that I'm going to become a best-selling author or anything like that. Um, I just believe that it can hopefully will help. You know, at a minimum, a few thousand people, and maybe more. But I'm also hoping that it will attract some attention to our industry and how I really do believe this is one of the best uh, small businesses in America. And so I'm hoping that it helps my fellow laundromat owners. And I know a lot of them have already said they'll buy it and read it. Um, which is great. I hope it genuinely helps them, but I also hope it inspires a lot of people that are outside the industry that maybe are interested in the industry or um, never considered the industry, but then maybe come across this book and it, it, it attracts them to the industry and they see what a tremendous opportunity there is. Mm-hmm. But then I'm also hopeful that it's going to inspire people that maybe aren't going to get into our industry, but it's going to inspire the, what I call 10-year-old Dave Men's, um, maybe not attract them to our industry specifically, but just be an insp- inspirational story to uh, kids or even adults out there who, you know, maybe have given up on their dreams and shouldn't have. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. And and I know that sounds like a that sounds like a lot to ask of a book, but I, I'm not I'm not suggesting how big or small I think, I think I'll be able to accomplish those things. But what I'm really saying is that's the motivation behind the book. Um, so my attitude is pretty simple. If it helps 50 people, it's worth doing. Mm-hmm. It's worth telling my story. Mm-hmm. And if it helps 5,000 people or 500,000 people, that's even better. So that's, uh, that's, that's what I'm, that's my focus. That's my passion. That's what mm-hmm. I'm looking to do with the book. So mm-hmm. I'm, I'm hoping that it will do those things. So T- tell me about the title and how you arrived at that. Yeah, that's, that's kind of, uh, I've taken some heat for that. It's oh, provocative. Oh, I've taken some heat. <laughs> yeah, well, it's provocative, and the funny thing is, that's not my nature. Like, I'm very blunt. Like, I'm not a, I'm not a marketing, you know, smooth, I'm not a smooth guy, and I'm certainly not a provocative person, at least intentionally. Um, but basically what happened is I, um, I had the opportunity to tell my story um, on an international podcast. It's called Bigger Pockets. Mm-hmm. And it, they have a really big following. And it's, a, it's primarily a real estate um, organization, if you will, but they've got a business aspect to them. And they kind of found out about my story and they approached me and <clears throat> wanted to do a podcast on my story. And I said, sure, I'll tell my story. And during the process of telling this story, it was a pretty lengthy interview. During the process of telling my journey and my story and my passions and things like that, they referred to me as the laundromat millionaire. Because they're they're a business podcast, so they you know they're not industry specific like you and I are, mm-hmm. and so I was just the guy that became a millionaire through laundromats, right. and so they they just like off the cuff referred to me as the laundromat millionaire, mm-hmm. and the podcast was you know they have a really big following, and so I got a lot of uh, publicity and a lot of attention from it, and I was able to I think do a lot of good for the industry, and I've talked to a ton of people about the laundromat industry and how great it is and how they should pursue it and all these things. Uh, but I just, you know, when I just started to do, you know, paid consulting, I've done free consulting for years and years. Mm-hmm. Uh, but when I started to actually do a paid consulting service and I decided to write this book and um, some other things I have coming down the pipeline to hopefully help the industry, I just realized that I needed to have a brand and that was just catchy. Like it, it is, mm-hmm. it is provocative. Mm-hmm. Um, I've been called braggy and egotistical and, <laughs> and some not not so kind words. And I, I get it. Like I'm not even offended by it. Like I totally get why people would see that from mm-hmm. that title. Mm-hmm. Um, it, 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 it does come across very braggy. Um, but at the end of the day, I, I'm really always, I'm always focused on accomplishing my goals, mm-hmm. and I'm not really so, always so focused on how it appears. Because I know my heart. I know what my intentions are, and that's good enough for me. So if people think that I'm a Mm self-promoter and that I'm only interested in myself and I want to be famous and all these things, 
I get it. Like, I understand why they would think that. And I, if I were in their shoes, I would probably think that too. Right. But I know that's not the case. I'm, you know, I know I'm doing it for the right reasons. Mm -hmm. um, but there is something to be said for, you know, being, I don't know if provocative is the right word, but uh, there, there's something to be said for, uh, for catchy marketing. And right. that was something that was kind of given to me as a nickname, if you will. Mm -hmm. And I just decided, you know, I can run from it or I can embrace it. And if I run from it, then I still have to come up with a brand and build a brand um, if I want to accomplish the things I want to accomplish. Um, or I can just embrace it and say, you know what, there's going to be some negative with, with embracing this brand, this name. Um, and I just, I just accept that for what it is. Right. So it's, it has been controversial, absolutely. <laughs> I've had many, many people reach out to me and tell me they love it. It's fantastic. I've had just as many from me when I call nasty words. <laughs> well, it is what it is. Right. <laughs> hey, did, did you enjoy the writing process? I actually did. And, and mm -hmm. to be honest with you, um, you know, not a lot of the book, but a part of the book. Um, just a few chapters in the very beginning actually cover um, <clears throat> some tragedy and some childhood, mm -hmm. uh, or some tragedy and the poverty that I grew up with in my, in my childhood. Mm -hmm. Um and so it was very, I didn't know it at the time, but my wife pointed it out to me and it, and it has been, it was very therapeutic for me sure. um, to, mm -hmm. to put those things on paper and have to process them and think through them. And, um, and so it was, it was, uh, it was hard, like a really, to be honest with you, it was really hard. Mm -hmm. Um, but, but I'm really proud of the book and I'm excited to get it in people's hands and I'm, ex I'm excited for, you know, like I said, hopefully it inspires and helps some people. Well, uh, but there's a lot of, uh, it, it's not a fluff piece. It's, there's a lot of very practical. It's much more about my journey in the laundromat industry and how I went from square one of buying an unprofitable store to where I am today. It's mm -hmm. much more about that than, than the fluff that is my childhood. Mm -hmm. um, but I, did, I felt like it was important to kind of have some context and have, mm -hmm. have an appropriate backstory for people to really understand kind of who I am. So that is in the book. Right. Well, I know it's out uh, later later this year, and best of luck with it, Dave. Um, Thank you. I appreciate that. For the for the new investors out there who are listening, what is possibly the most common myth of laundry ownership in your mind? Um, I think the most. I think honestly, the I believe the most common myth in our industry is that we as laundromat owners can't afford to reinvest in our business. Mm. My, my success in this industry is directly correlated to my constant and obsessive reinvesting mm -hmm. and always seeking to, to have my businesses be better tomorrow than they were yesterday um, in every aspect of my business. <clears throat> and some of those are just a matter of effort. They're not a matter of finance. They're not a matter of investing money. But many of those things are a matter of investing money. And when you're in my situation and you don't have the money, then you have to borrow it. Mm -hmm. And so there's a risk associated with leveraging yourself and borrowing money to invest in your business to take it to another level and hoping that that investment is going to pay off tenfold. And luckily for me, it has. Um, but I'm, I'm aware that a lot of the reason that people are, uh, you know, they give pause to, to borrowing money to reinvest in their business, especially for something that they may or may not consider essential or needed. Um, I get it. There's risk there, mm -hmm. and that's very real. Um, but I, I really believe that's the most common myth mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. is that, you know, if you if you have a laundromat that's making <clears throat> three or $4,000 a week in gross sales, um, you know, if you if you go take out an equipment loan that's going to be $1,800 a month and you put a bunch of new equipment in your store, mm -hmm. If your revenue doesn't increase, then that was not a good decision, right? Because right. you borrowed a bunch of money to buy something that didn't improve your business. But I can honestly say I have had thousands of conversations in my years in the business with laundromat owners. And I can also say that in my journey, I've spent probably anywhere from one and a half to two million dollars on new equipment. And okay. I am not aware yeah. of anyone, including myself, that has ever bought a piece of equipment that otherwise, this is the only preface, that otherwise had a healthy business and and borrowed money and invested in their business and that it didn't pay for itself. Mm -hmm. 
I'm not aware of a single situation. There's a few reckless situations where they didn't have a healthy business or they, they made the wrong decisions. They didn't have the right education. But assuming that those things are foundational things are in place, right. if you have 10, 12, 15 year old equipment or older, mm -hmm. that new equipment will almost always pay for itself in increased sales, increased bend prices, lower utility costs. Um, I mean, your margins should improve mm -hmm. and that, that equipment should pay for itself plus mm -hmm. some. Mm -hmm. So when you come out the other side of the equation, <clears throat> excuse me. When you come out the other side of that, that equation, you should end up with a much healthier, more profitable business that's better positioned for serving your community and serving your family in the future. But for, for whatever reason, a lot of people get stuck with this mentality of, if I have $16,000 a month in gross revenue and I take out a note that's $2,000 a month, then I have $2,000 a month less money to run my business or to pay my bills. And that's a very, what my friend Jordan Barry at the Water My Resource and I, it's what, it's what we call a, uh, a scarcity mindset mm -hmm. versus an abundance mindset. Mm -hmm. So the scarcity mindset real quickly is just that their money is scarce. Mm -hmm. Success is scarce. There's not an abundance of these things. And so I really see it as kind of a shift in mentality. Mm -hmm. um, and it's also something that I'm, that I'm pretty passionate about getting out to the industry is that there, there are a lot of people that are sitting on absolute gold mines. And all they have to do is make a few specific decisions, and their business is going to go to a whole different level. Mm -hmm. And either they don't realize it, they don't have the education, or they don't believe it. Mm -hmm. um, and so I, I think that is unequivocally, I don't even think it's close. Mm -hmm. um, you know, there's, there's other cliche ones, like, you know, uh, the water mine industry, you know, the water mine runs itself, and, 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 you know, all you have to do is show up, collect your money, and right, right. all these cliche things, which are all which are all absolutely messed, too. Mm -hmm. But I actually believe that as big, of, as big as those myths are, I really, truly believe that this is monumentally bigger than that, mm -hmm. because I, I believe it's life-changing. I've witnessed it myself in my businesses, and I've witnessed it with literally hundreds of other water mine owners. Mm -hmm. It's powerful stuff. Right. It really is. Very much. Um, do you have a business philosophy that guides your decisions, Dave? In business or, yeah, or in life? Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely I do. And, and, and they're, they're somewhat directly correlated. But, yeah, in business, my philosophies, and these have evolved. Let me, let me be clear that I didn't always, I didn't always know what I know now. Um, and hopefully five years from now I'll know way more than I know currently. Um, but my business philosophy is really a couple things. One of them is always do what's right. So regardless of whether it's profitable, regardless of whether it's in my personal best interest, always do what I perceive to be the right thing to do. Um, I guess you call that kind of a moral compass, if you will. Mm -hmm. Um, and that's kind of the foundation that I do everything in my life. So that's how I raise my children, you know, type of husband I try to be. But it's also, you know, foundationally at the core of my businesses. Um, and then the next thing is to surround myself with people that are of the same mindset. So people that believe that same thing. I don't want to have to beat it into them. I want that to be who they already are. Mm -hmm. um, and so those are the people, that, that rock star team I refer to, those are the people I'm always looking for. And when I find them, I won't let them go. Like, I will take care of them. I will compensate them. I will treat them like the rock star that they are because I appreciate them to a level that probably most other businesses don't. Um, and then the next thing to that is systems. You know, I'm a big, um, you know, the book e -Myth. Um mm -hmm. I'm really big on systems and processes and people. Um, and, you know, I, I, early on, I owned a job. There's no doubt about it. And I was aware of it. But mm -hmm. my goal has always been to not own a job forever. My goal has always been to own a business. And business involves quality people, quality systems and quality training. But then when you build those things out, and this takes years, this is not like a get rich quick kind of situation. This takes years to implement these things in one store, let alone a multi-store chain. Um, but when you do those things, you wake up years later and you have a more profitable, more healthy business. You serve the community. You've created opportunities for, you know, I, I've created 40 jobs, almost 40 jobs that didn't exist. Mm -hmm. 10 years ago. Mm -hmm. um, some of them are higher paying jobs than others, but the reality is, you know, I take great pride in knowing that those people's ability to pay their bills and support their families um, is directly correlated to the, the businesses that I have built. 
So that's that's kind of a big picture of kind of my business philosophy and kind of start to end. Mm-hmm. That's kind of how I would prioritize those things because you can have the best systems in the world, and if you don't have good people working those systems, mm-hmm. I'm not I'm not a I'm not a big like you can plug anyone into the proper system and it'll work. Mm-hmm. I don't believe that. I believe we people are they're, they're my ace in the whole times ten, mm-hmm. and I I do believe that systems and processes and training are important. But I believe if I put the people, the right people, in the right place first and then support them with the processes and the systems and the training. I, I really believe that I my business will be what I call uncompetable, meaning, you know, it's, a, it's, a, it's kind of a whimsical term. It's not a real word. <laughs> <laughs> but uncompetable, I, I refer to it as, you know, my philosophy is always, if somebody wants to build a water back right across the street from me, right. good luck. Right. Because they can't compete with me. Right. And that sounds really egotistical, but really what I'm doing is saying, it's not me. It's not Dave Mems. I believe my team and my systems and my processes are so strong, and I believe that every day, if there's an opportunity for to be better, we are all pursuing that. I'm not just pursuing this on my own. My managers, my entry-level employees, my delivery drivers, they're all looking for every aspect of the business to be better and improve, mm-hmm. and I empower them to right. find those things and bring them back to the organization and they see that we're not afraid to, to implement those things. Um, and so my philosophy is someone builds a business, you know, a laundromat or whatever right across the street from me, they can do things as well as me, but they can't do things better than me. <laughs> um, and I guess that's, that's, uh, that's uh, you know, I'm always, I'm always looking for perfection. I'm aware that it's not real. <laughs> it doesn't exist. Okay. Um, but but that's, what, that's what we're going to always strive for. Well, Dave, uh, along, along those lines of being um, uncompetable, uh, in your experience, when a laundromat fails, what, what's the most common reason for that failure? Um, I think there's probably a lot of different reasons. I could say it's probably unique to different, you know, different laundromats and different environments. There are some markets out there that are just, you know, the laws of supply and demand are very real. Mm-hmm. And, you know, if there's, if there's a market that demographically and population-wise needs three laundromats and some people, you know, somebody comes in with too much money and decides to build five. Um, there isn't a whole lot we can do. I mean, you can be run of a great business, but they've destroyed the market. So I mm-hmm. think there are, I know there are situations out there where people have done everything right. Maybe not everything, but most things right. Um, and someone, you know, some, some, uh, something came into the market that was out of their control and just destroyed their market. So I think that's one thing. That's probably rare, but I do think that exists. I've seen a few markets like that where I'm like, I, I couldn't do anything with this. There's nothing you, like, these people are mm-hmm. crazy. <laughs> 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 this, the, stuff, the stuff people do sometimes is crazy. Mm-hmm. Um, but I think, most of the, I think most of the time, it's probably a totality of all the things we've talked about in this interview, mm-hmm. which, which ultimately all comes back to value. I think most laundromat owners... Um, don't realize that they should be focusing on the big picture, which is value and their value proposition mm-hmm. to their market and making sure that they provide better value in their market than any of their competitors by far. Mm-hmm. And I mean, it shouldn't even be close. Um, you, you know, way too many times I hear and see on message boards and things like that where people talk about, you know, how do I know what to set my prices at? You have 90 laundromat owners comment in the thread and tell them, go look at your competitors. And, and I've always just thought that was the craziest thing in the world to me mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. because if I'm operating at a level that's much higher than my competitors, why would I want to be priced anywhere in the ballpark of where their competitors are? And to give you a quick example, I mean, my prices in almost every situation, and I have legitimate competitors, um, in almost every situation, my prices are anywhere from 70 to 100% higher than any of my competitors. Mm. But my value proposition, I can charge double what you charge Mm -hmm. if my value proposition is three or four times what yours is. Mm -hmm. And I still win the battle when it comes to overall value. Mm -hmm. And I think that's a lot of times what laundromat owners, especially in this industry, they sell themselves really short because they think that the only people that use laundromats are poor people. Mm -hmm. And the only people that, um, that, the only thing poor people care about are price. Mm -hmm. And neither one of those things are true. And that's a, also a whole different podcast. <laughs> um, but the reality is there we serve all segments of society. I mean, absolutely people that are in poverty.
poverty and low income, they absolutely use laundromats. I'm not suggesting they don't. But those people care about value. They care about comfort. They care about safety. They care about those things. And in most cases, they are willing to pay for those things. And so, you know, I've been accused of gouging people. And, but the reality is I'm, my expenses are at a whole different level mm -hmm. than most of my competitors. And so, of course, my prices are going to be at a whole different level, too. Mm -hmm. But the reality is the market, the supply and demand of the market will tell me if I'm doing things good or bad. And it tells me that every year I'm doing things better than the year before. So I'm just going to keep doing that. Right, right. It certainly gets back to that uh, uh, maybe false price sensitivity and um, yeah. uh, the image of the industry and uh, and, and those kinds of things. Um, but, yeah, very interesting. Well, personally, what's the biggest mistake you've ever made in this business, if you care to share? Mm. You know, I... I was very fortunate in a sense of I found a equip an equipment distributor, an HM company here in Cincinnati. They're a uh, hips distributor. Mm -hmm. And I found them during my due diligence period before I actually closed on my first store. Mm -hmm. And so, and, and, and the owner of the company has now become one of my best friends. Um, and I was very, very fortunate in the sense of I had an absolute rock star of a mentor from literally the day before I bought my first store. Mm -hmm. And so I haven't made a ton of mistakes, but that's not that's not a credit to me because if I didn't have him in my corner, I, there's no doubt in my mind I wouldn't be where I am today. Um, and so I think honestly, I think probably the biggest mistake that I made, and I don't know if it's an, like an isolated mistake, is not understanding what I talked about a minute ago with a value proposition. Like mm -hmm. I spent probably the first six years of my business focused on price mm -hmm. and competed, trying to compete on price. Mm -hmm. But the difference was my personality being kind of a perfectionist. My personality was trying to compete on price while trying to run, the, you know, trying to operate the best laundromats on the east side of Cincinnati right. as far as quality and value because I only know one way to do things and it's the best. Mm -hmm. Whatever the best is, that's what I want to be. I'm not under the illusion that I am the best or always was the best. But that's my goal. That's what I'm shooting for. Right. And the reality is to, to operate at the highest level in our industry isn't the cheapest way to operate. So you're, you, you, can't, you, can't be the, you can't operate at the top of the industry with the highest expenses in the industry right. and then have the lowest prices mm -hmm. or even in the middle sure. because you, your margins, you mm -hmm. I mean, you're, you're, it all comes out of your pocket. It all comes out of your margins. Mm -hmm. So ultimately what I'm saying is the first five or six years I was in the business, that's the biggest mistake I made was not understanding Mm -hmm. that my value proposition was so much higher that I could raise my prices and still have similar margins to my competitors, but probably provide a much higher value proposition. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I didn't, I didn't understand that. It was just an educational process that I had to learn. Mm -hmm. And to be honest with you, I learned those things through reading Planet Laundry, listening to podcasts like this, mm -hmm. joining the CLA, going to clean show, networking with laundromat owners. It was all, it all comes full circle back to that passion of, of networking and wanting to learn from other people. Um, and so I know it's not like one isolated incident where I bought a store I shouldn't have bought or something like that. Mm -hmm. uh, but that, I mean, that it was life changing when I figured that out. When I cracked that code, mm -hmm. everything changed. Right. It's. So it's, I think that's probably the biggest mistake that I that I ever made. Yeah, it, it, it's all part of the natural, I guess, evolution and, and as you say, education of yourself yeah. as a laundry owner. And I think uh, probably most owners uh, kind of go through that, through that change. Sure. Uh, who, who do you turn to for business advice? You've given us a lot of advice uh, today. Uh, who do you turn to? Um, I turn to anyone that I believe is doing what I want to do and has the information and is willing to share it. And that, I know that sounds like a complete cop-out of an answer, but <laughs> I have, like, you know, 10, 10, 11, 12 years, whatever it's been in the business, I've, I've always been passionate about networking and, mm -hmm. and those types of things and education. Mm -hmm. So I'll, I'll learn from anyone. Mm -hmm. I don't care. I don't care if you've been in the business five minutes. I've, I've had consulting clients that have come to me because I know our industry. And within a half an hour, it's obvious they know more about business than me. Mm -hmm. I know I know more about the laundromat industry than they do, mm -hmm. but they know more about business than me. Right. So I'm not afraid to learn from anyone ever under any circumstance. Mm -hmm. But I really believe that the people we should be focusing on learning from is 
the people that are actively doing what we want to do. So I, I don't want somebody that did it 30 years ago, mm -hmm. and I don't want somebody that operates in theory, you know, somebody that operates in a classroom but has never actually done what I want to do. Right. They've just read how to do what I've done. I want to learn from the people that are doing it. Mm -hmm. And I think that's why I'm, I'm such a big advocate for, you know, organizations like the CLA and networking with my fellow laundromat owners. Mm -hmm. It's just these are people that are doing it every single day. Right. And we're all collaborating and sharing information. I know that's what's best for the industry. And I've learned over time that that's, that's the best way to learn. Mm -hmm. There is not a better education out there than going to someone that is doing what you want to do mm -hmm. really well at a high level and learning from them. And that's actually why I started my consulting business. It wasn't because I needed more money or an extra revenue stream. Um, I did it because I needed to limit you know, my time. I don't spend a whole lot of time doing consulting. Um, but I am passionate about helping people that come to me and I see that we're like-minded and have a good fit and that I can really bring them a tremendous value. Um, and so that's, 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 that's where I would come at it from. Right, right. Well, we are at the beginning of a new year, uh, thank goodness. Uh, what, what, are, what, are you, what are your New Year's resolutions uh, for your business in 2021? Do you make any? Do you have any? Um, you know, I'm not really a New Year's resolution kind of guy in the, in the stereotypical sense. Okay. Goals? Um, so I don't, you know, at the, at, the, at the end of the year, I don't come up with specific, uh, specific resolutions to change. Mm -hmm. But um, my, my, goal, or my goals in 2021 which I've probably beat as a, you know, to a dead horse at this point, my goal is to bring value to the industry because I have great businesses. They have awesome people behind them. I'm going to continue to operate them and run them and be involved in them, but I don't spend 40 hours a week in my business. Mm -hmm. And I've, I've just realized that there's a need, and I've realized that I'm in a position where I can be a part of the solution of taking our industry to another level. So a big part of my focus for 2021, I mean, I have – Excuse me. I have a YouTube channel under the Watermat Millionaire name. Um, I have the book coming out and some things like that. Um, and I just want to continue to meet more people and get to know more people and network with more people and hopefully help more people. <clears throat> so those aren't any one specific goal. But like my YouTube for a chain, my YouTube channel, for example, it's not. I'm not focused on monetizing it, which a lot of people do. Mm -hmm. I'm just focused on helping people and growing my subscribers. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so but the, my, my philosophy is if I have a thousand people follow my YouTube channel, hopefully that's a thousand people that are watching my videos. Right. And if I, if I spend two, three, four hours putting together a video and I put it out, my philosophy is that time that I invested in that can pay dividends forever. Mm -hmm. Because if I'm consulting one-on-one -on -one with a client, you know, I have to spend an hour on the phone with them to help them for an hour. But if I put out books and videos and things like that, then I can help people in perpetuity. And so I don't know how many people those, those videos on my YouTube channel are going to help. But I just know that if people don't know about my channel, they don't know that I'm doing this and that I just have the heart of a teacher and just want to help people and I'm not focused on you know making money, um, if they don't know my channel exists, then they can't watch my videos is the point. But unlike, I think, a lot of channels on YouTube, my, my channel isn't about me. It's about, it's about helping the industry. Mm -hmm. so I think, I don't know if it's a New Year's resolution, but my passion for 2021 <laughs> is the things that I just talked about. Right. You, you said something interesting, uh, heart of a teacher. Uh, you clearly have that. Yeah. You clearly have... A, a passion for the industry and for helping others, especially those who are new to it, new investors. Uh, with that said, uh, what advice do you have for today's new or potential laundromat investors? I mean, what should they be doing? Uh, what should they definitely be avoiding? And again, I know you've covered a lot of stuff uh, in our conversation, yeah. but are, are, are there, I, I don't know, maybe that's not even a fair question, but uh, what, what, what's the best advice you have for, for the new investors out there? Um. So, so there's there's several things. Hopefully, that's okay. Um, mm -hmm. One of them is join the CLA, and I don't say that because Planet Laundry is part of the CLA. Mm -hmm. I say it because I believe it. Mm -hmm. um, I'm a very pragmatic person. If I believe something, I'll say it. And if I don't, I won't. Even if people don't want to hear it. Mm -hmm. So I'm not saying that to 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 to, to, to smooth you over. <laughs> <laughs> I believe that the, that the CLA and the Planet Laundry magazine and podcast um, are big parts of what have made me successful. 
And so I'm very passionate about letting people know that those resources exist and that if you're not tapping into those resources, like you're crazy because you are leaving so much potential and money and growth and opportunity on the table. And then the next thing I'll say is there are many other organizations that are maybe not to level with the CLA because the CLA is like the monster of our industry, right? Um, the, there are many other organizations like my YouTube channel, for example, um, that are out there that also have the same mentality. I mean, part of the reason I'm such an advocate for the CLA is because I've gotten to know the people behind the CLA, the board members, people like you, people like Brian Wallace. And I know that you people also have the heart of a teacher. Like you're, yes, it's a, there's, a, there's a job to do, but at the end of the day, these people aren't just punching the clock. These people are passionate about the industry and they want to help other laundromat owners. So the reality is when people, if you're, if you're considering getting into this business, the reality is this is an incredibly capital intensive business. And so what I mean by that is mistakes can be very painful. Mm-hmm. If you can, you can blink your eyes and make a hundred thousand dollar mistake in this industry. Mm-hmm. Um, it's very easy to do. And so you want as much information and as much quality knowledge as you can get on your side. And finding good mentors, hiring good consultants, working with awesome distributors, uh, manufacturers and the resources that they put out there, all those things are powerful things. So, you know, my, my thing is always, I, I'm, a, I'm a totality of everything kind of guy. And when you, when you just are constantly obsessed with gathering information and learning and your own personal education, then yeah, you have to filter through a lot of that. I mean, if you bring in a, you know, 100,000 pages of information, you're going to have to filter through and find the nuggets and find the golden nuggets that are in there and pick those out. But you can't listen to everything everyone says because a lot of people say conflicting things. But for me, at the end of the day, you should find the the uh, communities and the resources that have the best reputations. There's probably a reason for that. Um, and find people that are doing what you want to do. Mm-hmm. I tell people all the time, if you're wanting to do something that I am not actively doing and don't have an experience doing, then I'm not the consultant for you. Like, I, that's okay. Like, I'm not the guy for you. If you're wanting to go in a different direction than I've gone, that's okay. There are people, I promise you, there are people out there, maybe not paid consulting, but there are people out there in the industry that are doing what you want to do. And I touched on it earlier how there's kind of, you know, five, six, seven different models um, within our industry. And they can all, you can be very successful within all those models. So find someone and find multiple people that are doing what you want to do, what you believe your your model is going to be moving forward, and reach out to them. Because very few of very few laundromat owners in the industry won't give you a little bit of time. Mm-hmm. Now, I mean, can you call them for four or five hours a week every week? Well, no, they have lives and they have businesses to run. And that's where a lot of times, you know, paid mentors and consultants come into play, getting a membership with the CLA. I mean, that's, I, I can't remember what my membership even is, but it's two or $300 a year for like a, like a coin, you know, CLA membership. And I, that is, I, I can't imagine anything I've done in the industry that's bought me a better ROI. Um, that's one of the first things I did. And, and I didn't even know if it was the right thing to do. I just said, this makes sense to start with the, with the Clean Laundry Association in the beginning of my journey. And, uh, and, and I don't regret it. I've been a member, you know, every year and, uh, and it was one of the best investments I made. But ultimately what I'm getting at is invest in your education. But education isn't always learned in the classroom. A lot of times it's learned in real life. Mm-hmm. Um, so find people that are doing what you want to do and, and, and reach out to them. And you'd be surprised how many of them will give you a little bit of time and will help you you know, along your journey, mm-hmm. um, especially if they see that you're passionate, if you're willing to put in the work. I mean, if you want other people to do the work for you, you're probably not going to get a lot of help there. Um, but if you if you just want the information and you're willing to grind and put in the work, there this industry is so fantastic at, at just sharing information and giving to each other. Um, I'm proud to be a part of it. Very good. Very good. Last question for you, Dave, and I, I really do appreciate your time today because I know you're I know you're busy. Sure. Um, and I, I think I know your answer to this one, but is the laundromat <laughs> business still a good option for entrepreneurs? Or investors, is it still is it still a good option for them to jump into, and why? Yeah, I think it's a better opportunity than ever in the history of our industry. And I've only been around eleven years, so I don't claim to be an old timer or anything. Uh-huh. But one of the things I do, 
try to do a lot and learn from history, so I've actually studied our industry quite a bit. Um, I, I think the things that make this industry great are, um, are our cores, the fact that we are essential, the fact that we are a needed, a vital community service. Um, the fact that, you know, even during a pandemic, we are an essential service. We are needed. We are not wanted. We are needed. Um, mm -hmm. I think that that core has been with us from probably the beginning of the industry. And it's a big part of what, what makes up this such a great business. But the fact is the industry and the sophistication and the technology and the people that are getting involved in the industry over the last 10, 15, 10, 15 years probably – um, that are bringing us all kinds of new tools and new opportunities and new ways of looking at the industry. Um, I don't think there's ever been a better time to, mm -hmm. to get into the laundromat business than right now. Mm -hmm. And there's never been a, be a better time to be in the industry. And that's why I said during this podcast, that's why I said that I really believe this is one of the best businesses mm -hmm. in America to mm -hmm. own, especially small business mm -hmm. for sure, mm -hmm. um, is because it's never been, there's never been a better time to be able to scale. You know, there, there was a time, if you go back in, in our history, where it was really difficult to multi, run a multi-store chain, almost impossible, mm -hmm. um, because of some of the limitations in our industry. Mm -hmm. And almost all of those have been removed uh, completely. And we have options as far as who we want to deal with and who we want to do business with. And it seems like every year or two, we have new options. We have new people coming into the industry. And some people see that as a bad thing, but I, I see it as a good thing. I see it as a way of, of our industry growing and evolving. And uh, I always welcome new people to the industry because they always look at our industry through a different lens. And I want to see our industry through their lens because if I do, I'll learn something from them. Um, mm -hmm. So, yeah, you, you probably predicted that, but I don't, <laughs> I don't think there's a better business in America to own, and I don't think there's a better time than to own it than right now. Perfect. Hey, Dave, thank you. Uh, this has been, I've truly enjoyed sure. this uh, this conversation. It's been uh, eye-opening for me. Uh, it's been inspiring. Uh, and I'm sure that our, our, our listeners uh, uh, will agree with me. So, again, thank you for your time. And, uh, yeah, loved it. Yeah, thank you so much, Bob. I appreciate it. And uh, if I can ever help you guys out in any way, don't hesitate to reach out. This message is brought to you by Continental Gerbao. When it comes to new laundry development or existing laundry renovation, Continental Gerbao has your back. We work closely with our distributor network and provide ongoing services before, during, and after the sale. We help evaluate potential laundry locations, conceptualize your laundry's equipment mix and amenities, develop a pro forma cash flow summary, and once your financing is approved, assist with laundry development, signage, marketing, and technical services. At Continental, we have your back now and into the future. Thank you for joining us on our podcast today. Be sure to subscribe to Planet Laundry at www.planetlaundry.com slash subscribe and follow us on social media at Facebook, LinkedIn, Twitter, and YouTube.